Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, so good afternoon. Welcome everyone to our weekly research uh, conference. Um, just some uh, housekeeping details as always um, to remember to uh, submit any questions you have using the Q&A feature and uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to um, have those answered by uh, our speaker at the end and, and, and time for some discussions. Um, uh, use also the chat feature if you are experiencing any technical difficulties. Um, so it's my uh, pleasure uh, to introduce um, our survey endowed uh, lecturer in heart function uh, today. Dr. Navin Kapoor is an associate professor in the Department of Medicine and Division of Cardiology. He's the executive director of the Cardiovascular Center for Research and Innovation. Uh, director of the Acute Circuitry Support Program, Director of the Interventional Research Laboratory, and Director of the Cardiac Biology Research Chair at Tufts Medical Center. He is dual board certified in interventional cardiology as well as advanced heart failure and transplant. Uh, his clinical expertise focuses on invasive hemodynamics, uh, mechanical circuitry support, complex uh, PCI, and interventional therapies for patients with advanced heart failure. Uh, he has mentored uh, over 15 postdoctoral national international trainees uh, and directs a program uh, for faculty uh, uh, within the CBCRI. Uh, Dr. Uh, Kapoor's clinical research focuses on mechanical support and heart failure. He is the uh, founder of, uh, and executive director of the National Cardiogenic uh, Shock Working Group, uh, which will hear uh, hopefully uh, a lot about uh, during this uh, talk. He serves as a PI uh, for several active trials and mechanical surgery support, uh, including uh, Impella, uh, Shield to HeartMate Percutaneous Heart Pump, and the STEMI uh, Door to Unload trial. Uh, his translational research focuses on preclinical models of acute and chronic heart failure, invasive hemodynamics, uh, secretary support device development and cardioprotective mechanisms in the setting of acute uh, MI. Uh, his laboratory identified first that acute mechanical unloading of the left ventricle activates a cardioprotective signaling program in the setting of AMI, and he was the first to identify novel molecular mechanisms uh, regulating biventricular function uh, with uh, ECMO. Uh, so uh, it's with uh, great pleasure that we have uh, Dr. Kapoor here to speak to us today on the contemporary management of uh, shock. Great. Thanks so much, Sharon. And thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks, everybody, for having me join you today. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. So I'll be talking about contemporary management of cardiogenic shock, and I'll provide sort of a state of the art in 2021. Uh, as you just heard, you know, there's a breadth of knowledge and uh, discovery uh, that's occurring right now in the cardiogenic shock space. So I've decided to focus primarily on the clinical aspects, but we'll provide some new mechanistic and emerging science data uh, scattered throughout uh, the lecture. And then we'll hopefully get to the Q&A uh, so we can get to some of the management questions. So I thought we would first talk about very briefly some of the trends in cardiogenic shock, mostly just to make sure we're level set. Everybody's got the same knowledge base about what's going on in the shock space. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about what shock we're talking about. You know, I think cardiogenic shock, there's still a lot of defining that needs to be done. It hasn't been aggressively phenotyped and phenoprofiled, uh, which is a real challenge for something that's got such a multifactorial uh, and multivariate, uh, you know, co a component to it. Uh, we'll also talk about the field of risk prediction. This is something that we all struggle with as clinician, is identifying who's going to die, who's going to uh, survive, and through what sort of different uh, therapeutics can we apply to those patients. And then we'll talk about acute mechanical support, and I'll focus a little bit on just the mechanisms of these pumps, um, and then some of the emerging science. And hopefully, you'll once you understand the rationale of the technologies, uh, then it'll become a little bit more clear about where some of the emerging science is going. And then finally, we'll talk about some algorithms, clinical algorithms for shock management. I'll give you the uh, example that we've developed at Tufts Medical Center, uh, and then open it up to some questions. So I think it's pretty clear, cardiogenic shock, it's a global health problem. And it's amazing that today, one in two individuals who enter the hospital with cardiogenic shock will die in the hospital. And what that tells us is that this multi-complex, multifactorial problem still has a lot of unanswered questions. 
And also this is directly impacting our patients. It's one of the highest morbid mortality conditions in all of cardiovascular medicine. This is an illustration of a patient that's sitting in a unit. We're all used to standing at the bedside, scratching our heads. As you can see, we are using a lot of technologies, a lot of drugs, a lot of therapeutics, and we're doing it with very limited data. So even for vasopressors, inotropes, all of the mechanical support pumps on the left, the use of pulmonary artery catheters in the upper right, and then even ventilators themselves. You know, what is the utility? What are the best optimization strategies for ventilatory management? I think it is important to recognize that, you know, the prevalence of cardiogenic shock, it's increasing. We're seeing, this is from a U.S. experience in Minnesota, uh, taking, uh, you know, multiple thousands of patients and looking at trends over time. And this is something we see around the world, that there is this uptick in the prevalence of cardiogenic shock, especially as it relates to acute MI. What we're also seeing is that in-hospital mortality really hasn't changed that much. What we're seeing is a mortality range for AMI in shock of about 30 to 40%. And so this is despite, you know, over two decades of really advanced rigor in the space of cardiogenic shock from hemodynamics, drug therapies, and now device therapies as well. We also see that in a European experience that the mortality trends for cardiogenic shock in the red line on the left really haven't changed. What we're seeing is still mortality in that 50 to 60% range and some variable use of mechanical support in the blue line on the left, but this rapidly growing incidence of cardiogenic shock still marching along every year uh, in the space. It is also notable as a scientist, I always look at uh, the axes when I'm looking at graphs and you know, I always find it really interesting when people try to magnify the axis, but here the, the axis goes from 57.5 to 62.5% to show this, this, this uh, difference in the curves of in-hospital mortality. But I think it's really safe to say that 50 to 60% mortality is still abysmal for a clinical condition uh, in cardiovascular medicine. So rising number of cases and in-hospital mortality largely unchanged. I think one of the challenges in the field of cardiogenic shock is still trying to figure out which shock are we talking about. And it's also become quite evident that over the past 50 to 60 years, the etiology of cardiogenic shock has changed quite a bit. So if you take all comers shock and you look at the different etiologies, cardiogenic shock comprises the vast majority of shock phenotypes and shock etiologies. Within the causes of cardiogenic shock, what we're seeing is that the number of patients coming in with acute MI cardiogenic shock is now become, becoming a smaller piece of the pie chart. And now we're seeing a larger population of patients with non-ischemic cardiogenic shock and ischemic cardiogenic shock, but without acute MI. And so there has been a shift in the uh, etiologies of cardiogenic shock, the distribution. And we're seeing that acute MI and heart failure are really still the two dominant uh, etiologies of cardiogenic shock. But the reason why that becomes important is that most of shock definitions are derived from acute MI trials. So if we look at the original shock trial definition, this then led over to the IABP shock two definition using systolic blood pressures. And even in the ESC heart failure guidelines, we're still defining shock based on hypotension and then looking at things like congestion and hypoperfusion. And this may or may not make sense for a patient with heart failure without MI coming in with cardiogenic shock. And we illustrated this in a, our, a review article that's coming up in the next month, basically showing that the trajectory of a patient coming in with acute MI who has a sentinel event, a coronary occlusion, then presents pretty rapidly with cardiogenic shock is very different from the patient with chronic heart failure who develops decompensated heart failure, may recover and then go back to the left or may continue to deteriorate into worsening cardiogenic shock. And those two trajectories are really difficult to capture when you use things like ACCH and staging, NYHA staging, intermax profiles, and then now more recently, sky shock staging, because they're not tailored to the AMI versus the heart failure population. So in our work, we are beginning to dichotomize these two different entities and come up with different treatment strategies for AMI versus heart failure shock. And this is illustrated here. In acute MI shock, it's clear there's a coronary problem. It leads to ventricular failure. And then there's a vascular response. So patients often present with hypotension. The amount of myocardium at risk dictates how much impairment of systolic function. This can then lead to hypoperfusion systemically. And then ultimately you develop congestion. And depending on how significant the MI is, the, the time course of this can be very short or it can also be somewhat prolonged. 
But the difference with acutely decompensated heart failure or de novo heart failure patients coming in with cardiogenic shock is illustrated here. On the left, you can see a number of these patients present with congestion and a low output state. And you know these patients very well. They sit in your clinic with a cardiac index of 1.7. And if they're congested, you may say, well, you're decompensated, but is that really that person in cardiogenic shock or not? And you have to wait until this patient goes from congestion to hypoperfusion to hypotension before you finally make the diagnosis based on current clinical definitions, SVP less than 90. And in our view, that's way too late for an ADHF shock patient in terms of declaring them as having cardiogenic shock and starting treatment aggressively and early. And I think this is where this idea of defining risk and refractory cardiogenic shock starts to come into play. So refractory cardiogenic shock usually refers to cardiogenic shock that persists despite therapeutic interventions, drugs, and devices. And for years, our laboratory has been starting to talk about this language of dichotomizing shock into hemodynamic shock versus hemometabolic shock. And what that means is that when you have the onset of cardiogenic shock, the longer you stay in cardiogenic shock, it goes from being a primarily hemodynamic problem to now becoming hemometabolic. And as you can see in the illustration on the right, as you start to add more organs in terms of organ dysfunction, you can see that mortality start to creep up from 30 up to 50%. And one of the challenges in the space has been timing. It's been about making the diagnosis, stratifying the patient's risk, and then applying the correct therapies. And in the mechanical support world, this became very confusing early on because people were talking about providing circulatory support or ventricular support and using the term synonymously. Circulatory support means providing systemic perfusion. And that means getting your blood pressure up so you can deal with end organ perfusion. Ventricular support means unloading the heart, reducing the workload of the native heart so you can enable recovery. Coronary perfusion, obviously, for AMI patients and the need for revascularization. And then this fourth box of renal and hepatic unloading is a new area of really invigorated interest because renal and hepatic indices often dictate clinical outcomes, and they're usually triggered, uh, their dysfunction is triggered by congestion of the venous system. So when we think about the field of risk prediction in cardiogenic shock, it's important to note that risk scoring systems and clinical trials go hand in hand. So this is a really nice illustration from an upcoming review article looking at the different eras of cardiogenic shock. There was medical management for STEMI going all the way back to the 1980s. Then there was the primary PCI era. And in the top, you can see in the red font, different trials that were beginning to become tested. And then this era of contemporary mechanical circulatory support has now really invigorated the field of cardiogenic shock research, mostly because of the cost, the invasiveness, and the really, in my opinion, us becoming more aware as a clinical community that we have very little understanding of the etiology and the physiology of cardiogenic shock in the contemporary era. But the original shock trial is one for everyone to be familiar with. This was looking at acute MI patients coming in with cardiogenic shock and randomizing emergency revascularization versus medical stabilization. The primary endpoint was negative, 30-day mortality, but the six-month follow-up secondary endpoint was positive, favoring early revascularization. And this landmark trial was the first to develop a score system. And if you look at the, the little components of the scoring system, age, anoxic brain damage, end organ hypoperfusion, which was assessed based on urine output and cool extremities, shock on admission, prior cabbage, et cetera. And as these variables start to accumulate, your risk of in-hospital mortality starts to grow. The next trial that came along started to apply this concept of the card shock risk score for risk prediction. So it took the original shock score and incorporated a few more elements. So in addition to age, confusion, or neurologic status, and ACS etiology, it added low ejection fraction. It also added blood lactate and EGFR. So this was the first scoring system that started to apply metabolic parameters as a predictor of mortality and cardiogenic shock. And you can see that as you accumulate points in the scoring system, you start to get a significant uptick in your mortality. And the vast majority of patients sit in that four to six range for cardiogenic shock of the card shock score. The next trial that was done that was landmark and led to a scoring system was the IVP shock two trial. And this study, as you all know, or should be aware, included STEMI and non-STEMI patients. 
These were patients who had cardiogenic shock defined as hypotension and poor perfusion. And balloon pump was allowed to be used either before or after PCI, very little prescription about the use of balloon pump in the treatment arm, and no hemodynamic indices. And the trial was negative, suggesting no benefit of indiscriminate use of balloon pump in cardiogenic shock. Now, the IVP shock 2 score also used the age element from the original shock score, continued with lactate now and Timmy flow grade. So now we're seeing a few more elements, again, looking at metabolic parameters, but this is the first score that started to introduce lactate as a readout of end organ hypoperfusion. More recently, there's been an, a prospective registry. This is the INOVA experience out of Fairfax, Virginia. And this group used a algorithm that they wanted to test in a prospective manner to apply mechanical support for AMI shock. So they built a shock team. They used the uh, criteria to identify shock as hypotension, hypoperfusion, and a lactate above two. And applying an algorithmic approach, including a shock team approach, improved survival for AMI patients from 44 to 82% but really didn't move the dial for the heart failure patients in the red line. And it, those stayed at 60 to 72% in terms of survivability with the application of the algorithm. Now the INOVA shock score really started to drill in onto hemodynamics and metabolic parameters, this hemometabolic score, lactate, presser use, cardiac power output, a new hemodynamic formula, the pulmonary artery pulsatility index, another hemodynamic formula for RV failure, and of course, age. And so this started to introduce the high impact value of looking specifically at LV and RV hemodynamics, including exposure to vasopressors inotropes as predictors of outcomes in cardiogenic shock. The challenge is, is that despite these studies, the risk prediction in cardiogenic shock is limited. And in fact, tailored risk scores for AMI versus heart failure shock don't exist. So you can see that INOVA experience where the two had different uh, curves in terms of response. And what we're seeing is that in a real world population of patients with cardiogenic shock, existing risk scores have at best modest pro prognostic accuracy with no clear winner in terms of who's the best scoring system for us to use. So clinicians, again, are left with these multivariables, but not uh, more specific guidance on what score to use. And so new approaches to stratify risk in cardiogenic shock are needed. And a number of years ago, myself and a group of other investigators came together to develop a consensus opinion around sky staging. So this is coming from the Society of Coronary Angiography and Interventions. And these are basically a, uh, an alphabetized algorithm for saying whether your patient's at risk for cardiogenic shock, beginning to have shock, has classic shock, deteriorating or extreme cardiogenic shock. And when you look at the different parameters, what you're really seeing in the bottom left is that we're beginning to say, do you have hypotension, hypoperfusion, or both? And those are really the way that the consensus statement started to figure out whether or not we could scale risk based on this subjective criteria. And a number of studies have confirmed now the Mayo Clinic in the bottom left, the European experience in the upper right, showing that this risk scheme seems to be associated with in-hospital as well as 30-day mortality for patients with cardiogenic shock. And this is why you're seeing a lot of excitement around sky stages. But what we started to do at Tufts was we realized that in order to conquer cardiogenic shock, we really needed high quality data, not from a single center in Minnesota, not from a single center or a couple of centers in Germany, but we really needed multi-center data. And you know, one of the important quotes that inspired me early on was without data, you're just another person with an opinion. And giving lectures like this actually with just opinions is really painful for me personally. So I wanted to make sure we started to generate data. So we formed the Cardiogenic Shock Working Group in 2017, and the goal was to feed an unmet need, to have a large multi-center data set with real-world experience with shock, which included hemodynamic data, which included all mechanical support platforms from balloon pump to ECMO, and also that wasn't sponsored by a single corporation in cardiogenic shock. So we didn't want to develop a CVAD registry for Impella or ELSO registry for ECMO. We really wanted this to be led by physicians who manage cardiogenic shock and collect that, those data so we could advance the field. So with the Cardiogenic Shock work, Working Group Registry, in year one, we generated about 1,500 patients worth of data in a fairly short amount of time. We started to look at the sky stages. And instead of using the consensus opinion that was there, we started to try to put this into quantitative terms. And if we look at treatment intensity, I think this was really revealing for us 
because we saw that as you escalate the number of drugs on the horizontal axis or the number of devices that a patient's exposed to, you could start to see basically stratification of risk of dying. And as you go from B in the bottom left to E in the upper right, where you're seeing multiple devices, multiple drugs, we could also see that the, stage, the staging system could be quite useful. And when we looked at the stage, uh, the sky stages in mortality, for all comers, for MI, for heart failure patients as the etiology, we saw that the sky stages did associate with in-hospital mortality. The challenge is, is that despite all of the publications for sky stages, we can see that each group actually defined sky stages differently. So there's a lot of variable interpretations of this consensus opinion. And that is one of the challenges of whether sky stages will move the dial or not. It has to become more granular. It has to become more quantifiable. We can't simply go by gestalt. And so that's where the field is headed with sky stages. One of the opportunities we took by having a large data set of you know, hundreds of patients in cardiogenic shock was to try to reduce bias through machine learning. And so this is an example of, a, of sort of a data uh, graphic showing what's called a Spearman forest, where essentially you're seeing all these correlation plots where we looked at hemodynamic and metabolic variables and tried to see, are there correlations between the two? And we're, the goal here was to try to identify orthogonal variables in cardiogenic shock to come up with novel variates that we could use to predict uh, mortality in patients. From there, we could then create essentially a heat map. And the scale on the right is how tight is your Spearman correlation in a positive or negative direction. And then you can see in these all these little squares, the colorization allowed us to sort out, is there some new association that we hadn't previously identified? So for example, in the upper left, you can see right atrial pressure, this correlates with GFR. So as you have a high right atrial pressure, your GFR went down. And that starts to lead to this concept of cardiorenal and venous congestion. And then the other question was, what about things like cardiac output and lactate? And we didn't see much association between cardiac output, cardiac power output, uh, cardiac index. They didn't really associate with that hypoperfusion metric very well. So once we had this uh, Spearman correlation, we started to take our top 10, 15 variables and put them into what's called a k-means clustering algorithm. And the idea here is to now take hundreds of patients, which are the various uh, columns in this upper left plot here. And on the rows, we're starting to look at the different phenoprofiles that are being put into the algorithm. And the machine essentially runs the algorithm over and over again. And it's something we coded at Tufts. And essentially, we can see that there's starting to get more granularity and uh, more, um, more clarity as to where the different phenoprofiles are landing. So two phenoprofiles was too blurry, four was too blurry. So then we got to three and it became very, very clear that there were three distinct phenotypes of cardiogenic shock using the machine learning algorithm. We then looked at the same, uh, uh, the same algorithm and applied it to a validation registry. And we partnered with our friends uh, in the Danish National Prospective Registry. And they ran the same code and found the exact same three phenotypes of cardiogenic shock. And so that really helped us understand whether we're validating the derivation cohort and are these the same three patients' uh, profiles. So in order to understand what are the phenoprofiles, we then started to look at the variables that were put into the model. So hemodynamic variables and metabolic variables. And it became pretty clear that these three phenoprofiles are three very distinct patient phenotypes based on hemodynamics and metabolic variables. And what we learned was that essentially we had identified that phenoprofile one was primarily cardiac centric. Phenoprofile two was a cardiorenal phenotype where you started to get venous congestion and renal dysfunction. Phenoprofile three started to see multi-organ dysfunction. Now the liver is involved, the kidneys involved, and the heart is involved. And what this allowed us to do was now take the consensus of sky stages of CD and E, but now apply more quantitative granularity such that within sky stage D itself, you can actually see that the mortality ranges from 18 to 57%. So now we could, going forward, start to say, are you a D1, a D2, or a D3? And this provides much more rigorous granularity to prediction modeling to identify patients who are at risk of dying due to cardiogenic shock. So this area is likely to continue growing. We have a lot more data coming into the shock working group. We just finished version two of the registry. So another 3,600 patients 
uh, collected. And so we'll add more of these machine learning and AI approaches to come up with better score systems that are quantifiable. But one of the questions that came out was, can we improve outcomes in shock with hemodynamics and metabolic profiling? And there are a lot of discussions about hemodynamic data. So you can see here in this table we published in, uh, last year, all of the different hemodynamic formulas being used. It's important to know or be familiar with these formulas. They're designed primarily to tell us whether or not the etiology of cardiogenic shock has a LV congestion, RV congestion, or BIV congestion phenotype. So is there evidence of RV failure is one of the mo most important questions in identifying patients at risk for dying in cardiogenic shock. And we also looked at the registry to see whether or not this congestion question is a determinant of clinical outcomes. And what we found was that in fact, more than 50% of patients in the shock registry actually had biventricular congestion. So massively elevated right atrial and wedge pressures with low cardiac index. And if you look across the sky stages, the congestion burden goes up as you go from B, C down to D and E. And this is true whether you're an MI or a heart failure patient. And when we go back and look at even original data from the shock trial and shock registry, if you look at the published paper from 2004, you can see that across the different coronary uh, culprit lesions, right atrial pressure is actually pretty massively elevated. It's up around 16 to 23 for a lot of the patients. And what we're also seeing is that if you quantify RA wedge ratio, you quantify the pulmonary pulsatility index, many of these patients actually had subclinical RV dysfunction. Most patients were with RVMI were excluded from the trial. So this starts to point at this, the importance of using hemodynamics to determine, first of all, just the status of the right ventricle. And then the second, is congestion actually a target of therapy as opposed to just simply a bystander of what happens? We talked about that hypotension, hypoperfusion congestion trajectory for MI, but it might be even more important for heart failure patients where congestion is the primary initiating presentation. And in this paper that's coming up next month from our group, we started to look at different metrics of RV dysfunction. So first of all, what's the distribution of RV dysfunction in the total cohort of patients with cardiogenic shock who had these hemodynamic variables? And we can see that there is a significant, about a third of these patients are coming in with RV dysfunction. And when we look at the association between survival, no RVD versus RVD versus severe RVD, it's a stepwise progression. And this is most evident in patients with heart failure where you can see when you get to that RV dysfunction, that survival drops right down to 50% across the board. And so identifying RV failure is probably one of the most important reasons to look at hemodynamic data when managing a shock patient. Now, there are a lot of formulas that are still being heavily debated. Cardiac power output, I put up as one of the more controversial ones, primarily because this was studied in actually a retrofit model in the shock trial. It wasn't that they used it prospectively, to figure out whether or not it correlated with mortality. But cardiac power output actually, in my mind, is an integration of systemic vascular resistance and cardiac output. And as any clinician will know, systemic vascular resistance is an important determinant of cardiac function. High SVR with a low EF, a really challenging substrate to deal with. So CPO is not something we use clinically at our institution, but it is something that's still being studied. And its, va its validation has not been confirmed in heart failure and shock. Uh, and certainly the data is just beginning to emerge for MI and shock. But I do think this is still, it's a fundamental question in the field of cardiogenic shock. It's amazing to me that we talk about providing hemodynamic support, but there's a huge debate about whether to use hemodynamic guidance in terms of acquiring data to evaluate your patient. When we looked at the shock working group registry, we found that if you had the presence of a PA catheter in a patient, especially amongst sky stage B patients, deteriorating patients, this was associated with lower mortality. And this was also true for sky stage C patients, especially if the etiology of shock was due to heart failure. And so what this tells us is that PA catheters are an important tool potentially in evaluating patients with cardiogenic shock, but they themselves are not a therapeutic. There has to be an educational didactic program. What do you do with the PA catheter information? And I think this is one of the most important topics to tackle in cardiogenic shock. So we are beginning to develop a clinical trial evaluating the use of PA catheters in cardiogenic shock. But I would ask all the clinicians in the audience, 
would you be willing to randomize a patient to receiving a PA catheter or no PA catheter? And the Canadians might have a very different opinion than people in New England than people in Florida and, you know, or the Southern states of the United States. So I think this is a really open question, but it's clear to me as a physician that if I want to rule out RV dysfunction, look at someone in a continuous variable monitoring setting, having invasive hemodynamics is quite helpful. But the shock management guidelines are full of white space. This is a really nice uh, review from Sean Van Diepen, uh, basically summarizing the STEMI heart failure uh, AHA guidelines, as well as the European guidelines. And you can see all the white boxes. This is where we have no data. But even amongst the green boxes where we have some data and some guidelines, the level of evidence is C, which means it's really very poor level of evidence. It's clinical gestalt. And in the European guidelines, especially around pulmonary artery catheter in the red box, you can see that the guidelines are 2B, but in the US it's 1C for heart failure, no data on STEMI, and the AHA scientific statement basically says it's suggested. So a lot of data needs to be done. It's actually a little bit of a surprise that we don't assess hemodynamics during hemodynamic embarrassment, i.e. cardiogenic shock. The randomized controlled trial data are summarized here. This is from Holger Thiele, another really nice review, basically illustrating that there are a few things that move the dial, early revascularization, the use of vasopressors such as norepinephrine being better than dopamine or epinephrine, uh, the uh, use of other agents, not really as well clear, and then IABP and mechanical support, they're all in the line of unity. And the end numbers of these studies, really quite embarrassing, they're quite small. They're around 25 to 30 in the MCS space. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done there. But I do think one of the most important illustrations of the ability to perform a randomized trial came from Ben Hibbert and his group. This was an astounding and really laudable uh, study that was performed looking at all comers cardiogenic shock randomized to milrinon versus dobutamine. And what you can see is that this is a small but powerful RCT. It lands in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there's no difference between the groups, milrinon and dobutamine. So it's negative in terms of identifying any difference. There's minimal PA catheter use, minimal IABP or ECMO or MCS use in the study. And the mortality here still sits around 50%. So when I look at these data, I think they're extremely important because it demonstrates, as Ben once said on a recent lecture, that it's cheap to randomize. And the question then becomes, how can we generate more high quality randomized trials to really figure out what is the best approach for shock patients? And I think this is a real challenge in the space. There are many negative RCTs in the field of cardiogenic shock. And I think what this has taught me is that it's not about applying one therapy versus not having one therapy. It has to be testing an algorithm versus an algorithm. For example, an algorithm that uses PA catheters uh, and mechanical support versus an algorithm that doesn't use PA catheters and avoids mechanical support. That might be a more rational trial design. Some of the more uh, recent prospective registries are suggesting that using hemodynamically driven algorithms, the INOVA, the NCSI registries, may be being associated with better survival. Or is it just that we're being better doctors because we're actually using an algorithmic approach with hemodynamics to manage and decide what to do with a patient. Now, one of the really disruptive uh, aspects of cardiogenic shock is this introduction of acute percutaneously delivered endovascular mechanical circulatory support. And this is 70 years of operating and innovating in the field of mechanical support. I did highlight in the upper left that if you go into PubMed, actually the original reference to the term cardiogenic shock came out of the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1953. And at that very early time, the year after that publication, Willahai came up with this concept of extracorporeal circulation in the surgical arena. This was then picked up by Kantrowitz in 1967 with the balloon pump, 1972 with Bartlett and ECMO. The first attempt at a transvalvular pump was the hemo pump by Richard Wampler. And then Thorsten Seas introduced the impella in 2001. And if you look at the publication records in cardiogenic shock, you can see this significant upslope over the last two decades, mostly driven by these introduction of novel therapies, balloon pump, ECMO, Impella, now coming onto the scene. And one of the most important things in acute mechanical support is trying to understand what are your treatment objectives. Is your treatment objective to unload the ventricle? Is it to provide that circulatory support? Is it to unload the kidney uh, and the liver? 
And I think this is one of the most important aspects of this graphic is first decide what is your hemodynamic disturbance? What is the problem? Start to apply the right therapy and do that as quickly as possible so that you don't end up in hemometabolic shock, which is very difficult to recover from. I think we're getting to patients too late and that's a real problem in the cardiogenic shock space. These are, uh, these are classic you know, tables that are put out. We put this one out in 2020. Hemodynamic support cannot be used without hemodynamic data is my personal opinion. And you can see all of the different effects of these technologies and drugs. So I won't belabor these in terms of how the technologies are being used and what their effects are physiologically. The reason why MCS has become such a polarizing topic is that this field requires escalation of support. You put in a balloon pump, you then need something else, then you add something else. And as you start to accumulate the French size, it can become a massively invasive procedure, which starts to accrue risk, especially vascular risk, because you're now deploying all of these technologies percutaneously. And so I think that's one of the most important challenges is trying to understand how the devices work, match it to your patient, and try to avoid that deterioration into that metabolic parameter. When we look across the shockwave group registry in the US, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the use of mechanical support pumps. In the US, we still use a lot of balloon pumps. 41% of patients with shock get an intraortic balloon pump. When we look at the sky stages, as you go from B all the way to E, you can start to see that the growth of ECMO uh, starts to become pretty evident by the time you get to sky stage E. When you start to look at the number of biventricular support strategies, ECMO plus impella, that also starts to grow quite a bit. So sky stage E really is that end stage hemometabolic condition where you're throwing the kitchen sink you know, at those patients. I do wanna just make sure that we all remind ourselves about the fundamental mechanisms of these pumps. Intraortic balloon pumps are counterpulsation pumps. The Winkessel effect you're familiar with of IBP inflation and deflation gated to the ECG. The goal is to try to reduce arterial elastance, thereby reducing afterload. And it does so by dropping systolic pressure and trying to see if you can augment stroke volume. When you activate a balloon pump, one of the most important things to look for is whether or not the systolic points have come down. This is that systolic unloading effect of a balloon pump. And the diastolic augmentation is important, but it's actually less important in a shock patient, in my opinion, than the systolic unloading parameter. And how many times have you sat there and looked at the tracing to make sure that you're actually getting systolic unloading? And is this actually an important parameter to keep an eye in mind on? 40 cc versus 50 cc balloon pumps, very different achievement of systolic unloading. The larger balloon pumps tend to get more effective systolic unloading. The challenge is that we put in these balloon pumps and then we pray that they're doing what they're supposed to do. This is an 80 year old heart failure patient, EF 10%, who came in at around 9 p.m. one night, got a balloon pump placed, had a multivessel disease, we're gonna wait for the OR. The patient does not get a PA catheter and the patient has a balloon pump. The balloon pump tracing shows gorgeous diastolic augmentation. Everybody is reassured that this patient is on adequate IVP support. Six hours later, the patient is escalating up to those three pressors and someone in the ICU says, maybe we should put in a PA catheter. They put in the PA catheter, RA is 22, wedge is 24, poppy is 0.5, less than 1.0 means severe RV failure. The PA sat is 24% in this patient who's been sitting there for six hours. And the challenge was that diastolic augmentation does not equal augmented cardiac output. If you're gonna put a pump in, you've got to assess to make sure that the patient is actually getting the effect of the technology. And I think this is one of the challenges in the space is just overcoming the hurdle of this need for mechanical support and the use of PA catheters. It's also clear that balloon pumps have a very different uh, effect than rotary flow pumps. They're two distinct mechanisms. You can see here that as you turn off a balloon pump and activate a transvalvular rotary flow pump, there's going to be a significant increase in the mean arterial pressure and minimal aortic pulsatility as you start to take over the function of that native ventricle. And the reason why that becomes important is that when we start to look at the second box of ventricular unloading, what we're looking at is a reduction in pressure and volume inside the left ventricle. And the reason why that's important is because now you're beginning to reduce myocardial oxygen demand and metabolic demand is reduced for the native heart. And that may lead to improved chances for myocardial recovery if you can rest the heart while providing systemic circulatory perfusion uh, of end organs. 
And the reason why that becomes important is that when we start to think about how transvalvular pumps work, it goes back to a very simple equation. Device flow with a transvalvular pump is dictated by the speed you dial in, and in the denominator is a gradient across the aortic valve. And if you have a patient who's normotensive, there's a large diastolic pressure gradient across the aortic valve, 80 minus 10. But if you have a patient in cardiogenic shock where they're hypotensive and the LVDP is elevated, this delta P in the denominator actually becomes quite small. And if you have a rotary flow pump in circuit, you'll actually see that device flow start to increase. So the sicker your patient, the more efficient a, a transvalvular rotary flow pump becomes. And that's a simple concept as to why IABPs are distinct from the, some of the other emerging technologies. These pumps are also very sensitive to afterload. So if you have an SVR of 2000, then what you may find is that your patient has a lower flow rate than if the SVR is 500, for example, and that's when the flow starts to escalate. And that becomes very important because if you're using a transvalvular pump in combination with other pumps like VA ECMO, VA ECMO reduces preload to the heart and it can increase afterload. So if afterload and preload are two major determinants of transvalvular pump function, this concept becomes really important when you're trying to manage things like ECPELA or ECMELA, the combination of the two. And this becomes very evident in our clinics when we put in VA ECMO and we activate an impella at P8 and someone has an RA pressure of five, you're gonna rapidly reduce preload with the VA ECMO circuit. And if you put a transvalvular pump in, you'll get a massive suction event. And the problem is if this isn't identified, it can lead to profound hemolysis uh, with impellas combined with ECMO. And when we activate VA ECMO by itself, we see usually this very nice increase in mean arterial pressure. So it hits the box on circulatory support very well, but the LV pressure also tends to go up and that delta P starts to grow. So if you're a transvalvular pump sitting in the circuit, that delta P is going up, your device flow is gonna go down because that's the denominator. So this starts to affect how the two technologies work in concert with each other. And one of the biggest areas right now to understand is VA ECMO and its impact on myocardial function. Many people believe that VA ECMO causes significant increase in afterload and increases your PVA. And that may or may not be the whole story. And we can see in animal illustrations from our lab even, that there's actually a nice increase in pressure volume area as you start to activate VA ECMO. And if you add a transvalvular pump, you can reduce pressure volume area all the way down, almost down to V0, reducing, almost eliminating myocardial oxygen consumption uh, from the native ventricle because it's now basically uh, at rest. But the challenge is, is that our understanding of VA ECMO's hemodynamics is very, very limited. Here are two models. One is the Burkhoff model, the other is the Dickstein model. In the Burkhoff model, VA ECMO drives up pressure volume area and narrows native stroke volume. In the Dickstein model, it really depends on what your loading conditions are. So you can see in the pressure volume loop in black, this actually after VA ECMO has been applied, you see a reduction in the pressure volume area and you see a narrowing of the native stroke volume. Now, what this uh, article on the Dickstein side says is that there are three pre-ECMO predictors of LV distension with VA ECMO, low EF, low mean arterial pressure, and a high LVDP. So when you combine an EF of 10% with a wedge of 30 and a systolic blood pressure of 60 and you apply VA ECMO, that patient is at risk for developing LV distension and pulmonary, worsening pulmonary congestion. And the clinical data is emerging quite rapidly ahead of the science. And what we're seeing is that some data suggests that maybe there's a survival benefit of Impella with VA ECMO compared to VA ECMO alone in the US cohort on the left, the Germany cohort in the middle. And then there are others that say that actually there's no difference between Impella and IABP as a venting strategy. But there are a lot of unanswered questions here. And we recently were funded to answer some of these questions by asking, is venting the same as unloading with VA ECMO? Which approach is best? Is there a timing element? Should you do venting or unloading preemptively as opposed to a bailout? And how do we improve vascular safety when using this type of configuration? VA ECMO is becoming an interventional domain. We're seeing rapid uptick, about 11-fold of the use of VA ECMO for acute MI in cath labs across the United States. We're also learning about new approaches to VA ECMO. This is the uh, Minnesota experience from the arrest trial. And this group basically is the first study reporting feasibility of a door to ECMO time for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. And the door to ECMO times are around 15 minutes. 
So it's becoming very easy to deploy VA ECMO and use it, especially in certain conditions. The question is, who do you use it in and when? The ECLS shock trial is now actively enrolling. This is in Europe again, and it's randomizing patients in a very simple study design between VA ECMO with PCI and AMI shock versus PCI without VA ECMO. Once again, plug in the device or no device. Not really an algorithm-based approach, but maybe getting a little bit closer to an algorithm because of the inclusion of the need for escalation therapy to other mechanical support strategies. So we'll have hopefully results from this in Holger Teeley in the next year or two. Now, we'll take a step back here for just a moment because my laboratory for the past you know, 12 years has been studying unloading and whether or not it changes myocardial biology. We made this early observation and published it in 2013 with a tandem heart device showing that if you unload the heart, reduce pressure volume area, you can reduce infarct size by about 50%. We then confirmed this using different technologies like the Impella and found the same finding over and over again, that if you unload, you can reduce infarct size and enhance myocardial recovery. We then started to apply unbiased approaches, again, using genomic profiling, meta metabolic profiling, and essentially found that unloading drives a cardioprotective reprogramming of the left ventricle, especially in the setting of ischemia reperfusion. And this study then led to us to really look at the different effects of transvalvular pumps versus VA ECMO on myocardial metabolism, but also looking at mitochondrial function, a readout of ischemia reperfusion injury, and found essentially that if you can unload the heart, you can normalize myocardial metabolism and stabilize mitochondrial function. But interestingly, VA ECMO in this animal model actually caused a very nice reduction in stroke work, didn't reduce pressure volume area, and also didn't have a positive effect on metabolism or mitochondrial function. In fact, caused a little bit more mitochondrial damage. So the question is still open about how to use these technologies and improve the likelihood of native myocardial recovery. The door to unload pilot trial we published in circulation. This used Impella to unload and then reperfuse versus unload and immediate reperfusion, primarily to see if there is a reduction in infarct size. And what we found in this pilot study is that if you unload for about 30 minutes in a patient with anterior STEMI, as opposed to unload and then put uh, immediate reperfusion, there was a reduction in infarct size, especially amongst patients with the larger area at risk, ST sum greater than six millimeters. Now in the shock space, the National Cardiogenic Shock Initiative has started to test whether or not early use of Impella in acute MI and cardiogenic shock leads to better outcomes. And this is a pretty robust study. It's using, it's again, a prospective registry, not randomized, but they enrolled pretty sick patients, lactates of five. Uh, we saw that lactates over two in about 77% of patients, inotropes in about 73% of patients, and survival here was around 70%. And the question is, what intervention led to that? Was it the hemodynamic assessment with PA catheters? Was it early metabolic profiling? Was it the use of Impella? And arguably the, the most significant intervention here was the early use of Impella. And this is why you're seeing more excitement about the use of Impella early on in AMI shock. But I think it's really important to recognize that in order to advance the field, we have to develop a robust randomized trial. And this has to compare algorithm versus algorithm in cardiogenic shock. So we're developing the Recover4 trial. This will involve best practices that we've learned over the last two or three decades of managing cardiogenic shock. There'll be one-to-one -one randomization in the early concepts of IABP-supported algorithms versus Impella-supported algorithms. And I think this is really important to focus on those aspects of escalation strategies, hemodynamic guidance, weaning strategies, and vascular safety as we start to move forward. But the challenge in the field is that there's so much bias already out there. We've got to convince physicians to randomize patients. There are Impella believers, there's ECMO aficionados, and there's IABP uh, gurus out there. And we've got to get everybody to the same table to randomize in a rigorous trial. The reality when we get back to our clinical practice is that there's missing data and there's missing guidance. And this is a 70-year-old who had prior multivessel disease that was revascularized who shows up with NSTEMI, EF of 25% in the hospital, gets dobutamine, gets Lasix, has cardiac arrest in the hospital, gets resuscitated and goes to the cath lab urgently. Left main, 90% distal lesion, very successfully treated with a DK crush technique for uh, bifurcation of the left main, and also gets an impella placed. 
The challenge is that despite all of that upfront work, the patient gets a right heart cath on support. The RA is 25, the wedge is 25, the cardiac index 1.5, the poppy less than 1.0. 24 hours later, the patient has been escalated now to dobutamine, epinephrine, levofed, and vasopressin. That escalation on the shot on the drugs is really driving that mortality. There's poor lactate washout, there's suction events on the impella, and the patient is transported. This is during COVID, so all VA ECMO resources are exhausted. The patient has severe PVD. We recognize the RV failure. They get five ventricular impellas and has acute limb ischemia and care is withdrawn within 72 hours. It's extremely frustrating to see these cases because what we're seeing is delayed uh, management, delayed uh, monitoring, delayed reaction to the monitoring, escalation of drugs with the hope that that's going to work, and then trying to escalate mechanical support at the last hour when we're in profound cardiometabolic shock at that point. So at Tufts, one of the pillars that we try to educate our uh, referring centers and our own internal teams is early identification, identifying hypotension or hypoperfusion. You don't need to be hypotensive to be in shock. Early intervention, such as revascularization, and early hemodynamic profiling. So are you actually getting a profile of what is your patient doing? If you're giving drug therapy as your support, is that adequate? Because you're using a balloon pump, is the PASAT 24 despite great diastolic augmentation? One of the key barometers for us is achieving lactate washout, elevated lactate, and normalizing that lactate within 24 hours with combined hemodynamic stability tells us that we are averting cardiometabolic shock in that high mortality category. And then escalating therapy is really important if it's appropriate for your patient, meaning that if the patient's not DNR, DNI, or has other comorbidities that would preclude survival, you've got to escalate that support level from drug to device, uh, if needed, uh, to make sure that they get that therapy as quickly as possible. When we look at transfers, this is really important because in our community settings, we have about 23 referring hospitals who send shock cases to us. It's important to recognize what is unstable that needs to shift uh, to Tufts Medical Center. Hemodynamics, refractory arrhythmias, escalating pressors or inotropes, lactate rising, end organ failure and refractory hypoxemia. And I would argue that some of these are also too late. So if you have a patient with high lactate and it's not normalizing within the first six hours or the patient's requiring more intensive therapy within six hours, this is a trigger to transfer. And this is where portals of entry now come to our cardiac intensivist, our fellow on call, our ED to ED transfer. And then we do have a shock team. Now, I, I kind of say that tongue in cheek because a lot of places say we have a shock team, but this requires actually use of, ver of online platforms to get communication out as quickly as possible. And what this requires is a point guard. You need to have somebody who takes the ball and knows what to do with it, where to distribute it. And for us, that's our cardiac intensivist. All shock referral calls go to the cardiac intensivist, and then a text is sent out, a conversation is had, usually it's very quick because it's pretty obvious, and in some cases it escalates to a phone call to discuss what's the next step. When we look for transfers, one of the most important things is data that we collect from the transferring center. What is the hemodynamic status of the patient? A lot of our centers are now using PA catheters and calling us from the cath lab before they put the patient in the ICU metabolic profile, support profile, revascularization status, and what about vascular safety? What you don't wanna do is have somebody get transferred on VA ECMO or a Pella or Impella and have the limb be ischemic the entire time without anti-grade perfusion or other interventions that could be done earlier rather than later. The world has changed also. We used to implant most of our MCS technologies de novo. What we're finding now is that the community is beginning to get access to IVP, ECMO, and Impella. And now it becomes even more important to educate everybody about how those technologies work, when to use those technologies, and how to escalate. One of the things I use as a barometer of badness is the lactate. So I really think this is an important metric. There are limitations to lactate. Paralyzed patients, patients who have zero perfusion, no washout, those might be tricky. But in general, lactate can be a good hemodynamic or good metabolic parameter to say, how sick is your patient? And importantly, on the left, this analysis came from Jeff Marbach uh, from using the Do-Re-Mi study, that basically, if you normalize your lactate within the first 24 hours, your survival is so much better than if you still have persistently elevated lactate. So this is something that we've now used in our centers to help people adjudicate whether they need to be transferred or not. 
The algorithms we've been working on are shown here. We have separated AMI shock versus heart failure shock in our algorithms. The AMI algorithm really comes with a patient coming in with STEMI shock. One of the early things we do is we assess if, they're, if they have sort of marginal uh, blood pressure as opposed to being crashing and burning with a systolic of 60, if they're really quite sick, we'll go on to hemodynamic support and then revascularize. And that trend has been occurring more and more, support first and then revascularize, as opposed to revascularize, pray for the best, and then bail out, uh, crash and burn. What we're also seeing in those patients where we have sort of marginal hemodynamics is we'll check an LVDP. And if the LVDP is not elevated, we then will go on to performing PCI, for example, and then going on to assessing hemodynamics. The bottom line is for an AMI shock patient, they cannot leave the cath lab unless they are hemodynamically and metabolically stable. So what that really does require is an assessment using a PA catheter to figure out, is this patient responding adequately to the pharmacologic or the device therapy that we've applied in the cath lab? Because six hours is too much time for that patient to stay in shock, only to find out that we have to come back and now they're much sicker. When we look at patients with heart failure and cardiogenic shock, it's very different. These patients usually come in with varying degrees of hemodynamic instability. So now we're looking at need for escalating vasoactive agents, lactate again, failure to clear lactate. And you can see now we've kind of broken this into hemodynamically stable low EF patients with shock versus hemodynamically unstable. And the reason for that is as soon as the lactate's elevated and someone's congested and they have a low cardiac output, then we know that they're in cardiogenic shock. Hemodynamically unstable means that they're hypotensive. Hemodynamically stable means the blood pressure is marginal. And so those patients will get on the left, a right heart cath, sometimes a left heart cath if needed, assess the cardiac index, get that SVR calculation. If the SVR is over 1500 with a strong mean arterial pressure, we'll either initiate vasodilators like Nipride or insert a balloon pump. And that's why you're seeing a lot of balloon pump use in our institution is driven by the heart failure population. Hemodynamically unstable patients, we tend to go on to earlier support more quickly. And for the dilated cardiomyopathy patients, we tend to go to an Impella 5.5 uh, as soon as possible. VA ECMO is reserved for these patients uh, only if needed, because that, that, that load imposed on a low EF from the Dickstein model is something we're very concerned about as potentially precluding myocardial recovery. So I think in sum, there are a lot of different parameters that need to be sorted out in cardiogenic shock. The state of the art in 2021 is that we need to have this relentless pursuit of data and the willingness to randomize. So all of these open questions in this room, this ICU bed that we're looking at, require all of us to get educated about cardiogenic shock, and then most importantly, to be willing to participate in randomized clinical trials assessing different algorithms and different technologies and interventions. So I'll pause there and take any questions. Thanks very much for the invitation. Thanks so much, uh, Dr. Kapoor. That was a very comprehensive uh, overview of some of the more vexing uh, issues in, in the field. Um, uh, I see that there are a couple of questions rolling in here. So I might uh, start with uh, one from Dr. Beanlands, which sort of follows on uh, on your last slide on randomized uh, controlled trials. Um, and uh, he's agreeing here that uh, uh, there is a, a need for the RCTs, um, uh, particularly for uh, temporary mechanical support, but this would be a, a, an expensive uh, pursuit. Um, and uh, uh, potentially difficult for industry and or other um, avenues to support. Uh, how how uh, do you see this uh, pragmatically uh, occurring in, in, in this population? And, and I'd add to that um, uh, um, the fact that uh, you, you spoke about various uh, areas that would need to be looked at from sort of restratification uh, and what is a very heterogeneous population, the use of hemodynamic sort of guided therapy, uh, temporary MCS itself, and then within that, the, um, the uh, role of uh, ventricular unloading. So how do you, how do you imagine uh, uh, this, this occurring? I think it's a great question. So 
One of the things that I think is um, a reason why I have not been advocating randomized control trials in the shock space for a number of years is that I felt like we did not have enough data really to define cardiogenic shock. I think it would be, for example, a horrific mistake, for example, to enroll all comers cardiogenic shock into a randomized trial knowing that AMI shock patients have a very different trajectory than heart failure shock patients. I think it's also important to recognize that when we start to learn more about the profiles of cardiogenic shock, it starts to tell us who should be included in these trials. You know, enrolling patients who are likely to die, no matter the intervention, or patients who are likely to survive, no matter the intervention, really doesn't help. The vast majority of P equals NS in the randomized controlled trial space for cardiogenic shock is due to very poor patient profiling and the inclusion exclusion criteria are way too broad. We do not have really good handles on defining shock. Now, having said that, we are getting a better handle. We are beginning to learn, for example, that sky stage D patients and C patients are very different from A and B and E. And so it is possible that with this new, uh, this new approach to trying to profile shock patients, we may be able to identify the right patients to include in such a randomized control trial. The second point about how to tackle the multi uh, different aspects of managing of a shock patient, I think also depends on the type of trial. An AMI shock trial, probably the lowest hanging fruit to achieve. Patients have a sentinel event, especially if it's a STEMI trial, it's a revascularization, and then you can apply different approaches and different therapies. We even showed in this talk that in sky stage C patients with AMI, PA catheters did not associate with better mortality. It was really only for sky stage D patients. So I think that it really depends on getting a better granular understanding of who to include in a trial, dichotomizing MI versus heart failure in terms of the etiology of what you're, of what you're trying to study, and then basically starting to very selectively target what interventions you wanna test. And I think it's gonna be really difficult to test an intervention in isolation. So for example, saying, I'm only gonna do balloon pump versus no balloon pump. That's not really feasible, especially because of the bias that's out in the community. And so what we're seeing now is devices are approved in the US for the indication of cardiogenic shock. So they are being clinically applied. I think we have to get more sophisticated in how we execute RCTs. So for example, since these are commercially available, devices that are on label for cardiogenic shock, we can now do, for example, pragmatic trials housed within registries, for example, like the shock working group. It's 30 centers in the United States and around the world, all looking at shock data. The CRF is collected. Now what you need to do is embed a randomization element within there. I also think that some of the you know, newer techniques for trial designs, cohort designs, platform trials, uh, adaptive designs, they do lend towards the possibility of moving the dial. But to be honest with you, I think it was the, it's my original comment is that up until now, these trials, if you look at who's included and who's excluded, it's everybody. And it's, it doesn't really move the dial. I find that very challenging in the RCT space. Absolutely. Um, Peter, uh, you've, uh, your video is working now and you have your hand up there. Did okay. you want to? Yeah, so thanks so much, Navin. It's just a fantastic talk. I just love it. And uh, so um, a couple of comments and uh, questions. And the comments, of course, that, the, you know, don't forget the Canadians, we are willing to randomize. You can see already the evidence and uh, we're much more, you know, sort of objective in that uh, uh, approach. And that's the uh, uh, first point. And the second point, and I absolutely agree with you in terms of the kind of almost uh, more precision medicine approach, right? You know, in terms of categorizing a patient, I love the fact that you're able to cluster, you know, the patients and uh, identify the subgroups that actually are more similar to each other. The, the quick question are that, uh, are there opportunities down the road to potentially modify metabolic parameters uh, or, you know, in terms of uh, also, you know, especially the RV aspect, you know, that, that you talk about, which is so important. Yeah, so any thoughts on those? Yeah, thanks, thanks for asking that question. I think, you know, so I didn't really, I didn't really get into the, the molecular uh, biology, the science that we're beginning to discover in this field, um, mostly because we didn't have six hours to talk today. But, you know, it's an extremely exciting time because what we're beginning to find is that, you know, this world of cardiac metabolism, the molecular biology of injury, uh, whether it's reperfusion injury or not, 
uh, there are multiple targets uh, that actually can be can be brought in. On the RV side, I think it's really fascinating. This um, I'll give you an example. In CERC research recently, there was a nice review looking at the pulmonary artery pulsatility index. That silly hemodynamic formula that we developed many years ago, pulse pressure divided by RA pressure. And then actually at Hopkins, uh, and I'll be, I'm a little biased since I trained there, they basically isolated cardiac myocytes from patients with varying degrees of pulmonary artery pulsatility index, identified all the way down to force max generation and correlated force max generation with this hemodynamic parameter and showed that that predicts clinical outcomes. So there's no question that if you can target all the way down to the molecular level, improvement of RV function, a huge determinant of clinical outcomes in patients with cardiogenic shock, identify those patients with a hemodynamic formula that's easy, and then say, these are the patients that definitely will respond to a potential therapy, then that's really great. The other potential target is on the mitochondrial side. So what we're beginning to uncover is that these pumps don't just simply affect hemodynamics. They don't just push blood around. They actually change the entire biology of not only the heart, but the kidney. And this mitochondrial work of looking at the electron transport chain, looking at cardiolipin, integrity of that cardiometabolic axis, uh, all the way down to ATP generation, is vastly affected by whether you're on VA ECMO, Impella, balloon pump, or not. And so what that means is that are there new strategies where we can combine drug and device therapy to optimize cardioprotection, mitoprotection, and lead to better outcomes, regardless of what platform you're using? So we're just at the beginning of this field. It's really exciting to see molecular biology combined with mechanical support and also hemodynamics. So absolutely, I do think there's a great opportunity there. Um, okay, I think we're a little bit over time, but uh, we might just do one more question from the uh, audience. Um, this is a question from Dr. Kaura um, out at uh, UHN. Um, asking a question about uh, risk scores uh, and the use of risk scores to define uh, futility. Um, is there any sort of work on that and, 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 and role for that? Yeah, um, first of all, I'll just say hello to Sanjog. Uh, thanks for joining us for the lecture and um, thrilled to be interacting with him again. The, the question of futility, I think, is really critical. And we sort of discussed this a little bit with the RCT design, but even on a practical level, Futility is one of the most important questions to answer, especially when you're talking about highly invasive, expensive technologies. This idea of, with an unbiased approach, staying within the ethical boundaries of providing for your patient, doing everything you can within reason for a patient, I think is really challenging. Nobody, nobody in the US is gonna be very excited about hearing that their patient got a score of whatever on a futility score and is not a candidate for therapies. So I think this is one of the most challenging aspects of the space. I do think that there's a need for a futility score. Most of the trial, most of the scoring systems I showed are trying to predict mortality and outcomes. But I do think that a lot of them depend, are not at the time of admission. And so what you're gonna see now coming out from the shock working group is more aggressive predictive modeling using machine learning as well as standard descriptive statistics. And basically saying at the time of presentation, here's your score. Six hours later, here's where you're evolving. I think it would be a mistake to rely on one time point to make such a huge decision for a patient. What you need is an iterative score that changes over the first 24 hours of management. And if you see that this patient is declining, deteriorating, despite your best efforts, that's when you can potentially declare, declare futility or causing harm before you get to that E where you're on three devices. So I do think that the scoring systems have to evolve. Our thoughts have to evolve. It's a dynamic continuum in shock. It would be remiss of us to simply take an on admission score and declare you're not a candidate for X, Y, and Z. But this is gonna require a lot of data. So we need high, high quality granular data from thousands of patients across multiple centers without industry involvement in order to come up with this science. <clears throat> and, that's, and that's what we're trying to do in the shock working group right now. Thanks very much. Um, it's uh, it's it's getting a little bit uh, past one here, so I think uh, we'll we'll call this to an end. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Kapoor, for sharing with us. Uh,
uh, your uh, thoughts on this very difficult and red hot uh, topic. And it's, it's really encouraging to see uh, the work that your group um, uh, is, is um, producing, um, sort of spanning from the lab through to translational and clinical research as well. So thanks, thanks very much for joining us. Great. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you, Peter. Really appreciate yeah. the invitation. Fantastic. Look forward to collaboration and this great leadership. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.